Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Joanne, for that. And, and thanks to Peter. Where's Peter here? Where's Peter? Oh, he left. Way back in the back. I first met Peter working when he was in Selby Creek in the Napa and then with our Basins of Relations training a bunch of years ago. So when he gave me a ring and said he's been working here at the church and, and part of this lecture series, I said, sure, I'd love to come down. So um, happy to be here. And let's see. So I have the uh, opportunity, so, so to speak, to get to talk to you all about water in California, the drought, and this whole arena of climate change, and then thoughts about how we can adapt to that, if you will. So we'll just get going. I, um, I got a whole bunch of images and slides for you, and I'm gonna take you through a big story. So just hold on and grab what parts of it you can. It's a big, uh, wild and wiggly story here, and we'll see where we end up. And then I wanna save time for questions at the end. So um, as Joanne said, I'm at the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, and does that guy cut off the screen there? I'm just gonna, while I talk to you, I'm gonna shorten that up because some of these don't wanna be off the screen. Um, so have a look I, and come and visit us in West Sonoma County. We've got a great plant sales there and volunteer days and workshops and such. And then also I do operate this um, or direct this Water Institute. And so you can see their Water Institute is really an acronym. So I'm interested in this arena of watershed and advocacy training, education, and research. So have a look at us if you want. It's a separate website and such. And I guess maybe by way of a tad bit of introduction and background, how it is that I get to water, because my caveat, to be honest, is I've never had a formal academic training in, in water. I'm not a civil engineer, so I don't come out of that arena. I'm, I'm basically a biologist by birth, and then I figured out how to take that passion for chasing uh, tadpoles and snakes and frogs and things and, and turn wildlife biology into a career. And then at some point I think as an endangered species vertebrate biologist, which is really what I've done for the last 20 years, it became pretty clear to me that human land use patterns, urbanization, agriculture, ranching, forestry, uh, mining, have been being practiced, especially in the US, in a manner that does not appear to be so conducive for ecological integrity and health and well-being of, of other life forms. And so my, my passion for chasing tadpoles when I was three years old in a rice paddy in, in Okinawa, Japan, while my father was in Vietnam, or catching snakes while we were in Camp Pendleton in Oceanside, or fishing or going hunting with my granddad in Idaho, was a foundation that I guess engendered in me the realm of what we know as, or what some of us call biophilia. And so I'm a, I'm a I'm a biophiliac from birth and, and by profession, if you will. So that gets me to water, and I'll try to unpack why, why water as a biologist. But I guess my first um, interest right now is to say, if you believe or have been told that this entity here is planet Earth, you've been misled. Because it's really planet water. And so I first want to just welcome you all to planet water. Because as we look out there in the universe, we're spending all kind of money and time out there looking for water in other places and a little bit of frozen water on the dark side of the moon, sustainable moon base. Dark Side of the Moon was a really good album name, what band named Pink Floyd, but it's not a place to go inhabit, certainly not for a biologist, one who studies life. Why would I go to a lifeless place? So I'm, I'm kind of interested in working on how to keep this place livable for all life. And What's interesting in that regard is that planet water, it's the only place in the known universe where life is endemic. Endemic's a big fat word, right? Kind of a little bit like, uh, ostentatious. But what endemic really means is it occurs there and nowhere else. And botany folks, especially in Marin County, there's lots of serpentine hillsides with endemic little plants that only occur there. But at some level, if you look in the universe, as far as we can tell right now, as far as Life's endemic to this planet, and that's because it's planet water. And we have this incredible molecule, right? This Mickey Mouse molecule. So it's got these two hydrogen ears up here. It's got this big old oxygen face, and it's got plus charges on those hydrogens, a negative charge on that oxygen, and that magic Mickey Mouse molecule does crazy things. There's no other molecule on the planet that does what water can do. Imagine it can be a solid, a liquid, or a vapor these three phase states. And I'm gonna come back to a big point on that understanding of the idea of phase states of this molecule and such. Imagine as a solid, it floats on its liquid self, really? If I sank 
all bets are off that we would be here for sure. You could hit that solid with sunlight and go straight to a vapor without even becoming a liquid sublimation. This is an incredible molecule. I could go on at length about all the, the cool things about it. But one of the things that's really amazing about the, this process is the fact that, well, let's just say I'm really into nuke power and I'm really into desalinization. It's just not down in a plant in Carlsbad hooked to a nuke plant there that's splitting atoms. I'm into a nuke plant that's 93 million miles away that's fusing hydrogen and making helium and then sending energy out and desalinating the ocean, leaving the salts behind and taking distilled water and either dropping as a solid, a liquid or a vapor and creating what we would know as the water cycle. And the, this is one of the great cycles. And in the work I do, we talk about sustainability. I, I'd like to unpack the idea of sustainability and say there's two words in there, sustain and ability. Flip them over and beg the question, what are we striving to have the ability to sustain? And at some level, the answer better be the cycles of life. And the hydrologic cycle, I think, is one of the great cycles. So imagine this process, this cyclical process. All the water on planet water, as far as the scientific perspective thinks about it, last four billion years or so, the volume of water on planet water, the noun, if you will, the thing you drink and swim on and surf on, ski in, that is finite. The total volume, it, the differential between how much of it is solid, liquid, or vapor is changing. We'll get more into that. But the noun is finite. But because it's a cycle, the verb is infinite. And it's really different. Some resources don't work that way. Natural, renewable resources work that way, like this. So track in the linguistics of this liquidity in this landscape here that there's nouns and verbs going on, and, and they shouldn't be confused, right? And yet, it may be infinite in its verb, but it is inequitably distributed across the planet. And certainly it's inequitably distributed in California, this amazing state we live in. So the amount of water we get down in the Mojave Desert versus the amount of water up here, right? 200 inches of rainfall up here versus less than five. And then we know the Sierra Nevada and the wet spots and over here in the coast range where we're at in the 40s, 50s, 60s and such. And so it's this amazing resource, and yet it's inequitably distributed. The other thing I think when I look at water and I see a noun and a verb and I see the flow, ultimately, as far as I can tell, the water cycle and the life cycle are the same cycle. And so the basis of the fact that no water, no life gets me to, as a biologist, why I work on water. Right? So any development design that degradates and dehydrates landscapes reduces the carrying capacity for life. Right? So I'm interested in that because the fun part is, is all living beings on this planet, when they're actively alive and metabolizing, are by volume mostly water. Right? So every organism, we're carbon-based, our central atom of life as we know it is carbon-based, but by volume we're actually mostly water. And every, every critter up here from bobcats to wildflowers to scorpions, and these are all animals and plants and life forms that live at, in Occidental at Arts and Ecology Center there. Um, they're all mostly water by volume. And even little sharp-tailed snakes, if anyone's ever seen these little worm-like looking snakes that live in the, in the leaf mold and leaf litter and such. And even these organisms here in the kingdom of fungi, these things breathe oxygen and exhale CO2 like we do as, in, as animals. We're more closely related in the tree of life, for those of us who believe in evolution, than anyone else. And so you all are truly a bunch of fungi and fungals mostly when you get down to it, right? <laughs> and then we get into us hominids. And the unborn human is 100% water. We're amphibians, actually. For nine months, you're, an, you're actually an aqueous being. And then you pop out. And the older you get, the less by volume you water you are. Right? And so the game is, is that death is ultimately a function of dehydration. And so with that in mind, I propose a toast that you all drink some good water, stay hydrated. <laughs> this is absolutely after air, three minutes without air, I could hold my breath pretty good, but I'm bumming. Three days without water, getting really tough. Three weeks without food, I could actually use a good fast. Air security to water security to food security are orders of magnitude away. So in prioritization with what we need for life. So then we get into systems and ecosystems and water. 
And you could see something like a redwood tree. I happened to get to drive through Samuel, Samuel P. Taylor Park today because I was over in Bolinas the past few days and get a, a look at some of those amazing redwoods over there. And the idea that there's only 5% of them left in California because most of them fell to the bird's mouth there. Um, but that, that tree there is mostly water by volume, right? And the interesting thing about it is, is how do you grow a tree that big in a system? Well, you connect with other life forms that talk to water. And so here, this is a, a shot from the 1880s in the Eel River, but we could find the shot from Marin County, certainly in the Lagunita system, the Olima system, for uh, not Chinook salmon so much, although some do come there, but for coho salmon. But imagine this fish here, that's probably a 50 pound king salmon, a Chinook. That critter is, right, these are anadromous fish, you know what anadromy means? So they're born in fresh water, so the little eggs are put in the rocks by the adults and fertilized, and then they hatch if there's good gravel and lots of flow through there, and not all full of sediment, smothered. And then the little babies come out, and they maybe hang out in the creek for a year, a little less, depending on the species. Then they go out to the ocean. So they might leave this big, and imagine they come back three, four years later as a Chinook, 50 pounds. They caught a 140-pound Chinook up Sacramento a couple years ago. 140-pounder. That's going to then spawn and die, and in that death is the rebirth that resurrection through that, where, guess what? How many gardeners are in the house here, and what's your favorite organic fertilizer? Fish emulsion. So what's sitting there is a 50-pound sack of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, all the micronutrients, the NPK, and these fish were coming back up the watershed, spawning and dying on the order of millions of pounds, then to be taken by bears and eagles and otters and raccoons and native people and moved up the slope. And then the reality check here, and not to be too profane, but you are what you don't defecate. <laughs> and what you do do, waste equals food for the next part of the life cycle, such that scientists have found in streams in Oregon where they sample the needles of Douglas fir trees adjacent to the stream up the slopes. 50% of the nitrogen in the needle of a Douglas fir tree is of marine origin isotopically because it, it grew, it got that from the decomposing flesh or the recycled flesh from a salmon or a lamprey, the eel, <clears throat> a lamprey. And so this anadromous nutrient pump is this critical link where we have rainfall going down and moving nutrients to the ocean, making it salty. We get sunlight turning this pump and life developed organisms to go out there, get really big, bring it back to the ocean for nutrient return, sustainability, our ability to sustain the cycles of carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. This is critical for the growth of life in these watersheds. So these salmon, whether you're bummed about them nearly extinct in California because you're missing out on a salmon steak on the Barbie that pairs well with the Pinot Noir, which is a good pairing. When we talk about watershed integrity and resiliency, salmon are kind of important. So a really good friend of mine, Freeman House, wrote a great book called Totem Salmon that I would recommend. It's about the work they've been doing in the Matoll watershed in Humboldt. And this idea that the first thing we learned from salmon was the importance of the watershed as a unit of perception. Interesting notion, right? The idea that it's a unit of perception. <clears throat> and my work as an edutainer is really getting to the unit of perception that's most important, which is up here. And we, and we work in watersheds, we start in the headwaters. And I want, I'm interested in starting in the water in your head. The headwaters right here is the most important headwaters we have to start with. And basically I'm interested in mitigating cerebral imperviousness so we can infiltrate the information in an arena that I would refer to as ecosystem restoration. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm interested in the, in, the, in the ecosystem of us collective bipedal sacks of saline solution here. Basically getting a new storyline on our relationship to the cycles of life and, and such. Now obviously water is one of those things, maybe sort of like uh, you know, politics and religion at the Thanksgiving table in some families you just didn't go there. Um, water is one of those subjects as well that some folks didn't go there with. And even good old Mark Twain back in the, this is in the 1870s, his reference to California water politics here where whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over. And in 2014 with the state of the drought, and if you've been tracking the legislature, even out of the Senate with Feinstein and California legislature, whoo, the gloves are off and the fight is on. And so that's a tad bit unfortunate as far as I can tell. Um, 
There's a gentleman named Aldo Leopold, who's often considered one of the grandfathers of the modern science of wildlife biology. And, <clears throat> and he wrote a book called Sand County Almanac some years ago. Had a bunch of kids, all of whom were amazing. And one of them was Luna Leopold, emeritus professor, passed away some years ago at Berkeley, sort of founder of the science of fluvial geomorphology, fluvial flow, geo-earth morphology shape. It's the science of nerds who study rivers and watersheds and, and torturously meandering streams and all that kind of fun stuff. And this idea here that the health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. For me, that's a, an interesting quote because as a designer, I'm looking for systems where there's feedback in the design so we can evaluate the efficacy of our human settlements in place over time, a benchmark. We, if we don't have feedback, how do we know is it getting better? Is it worse? Is it stagnant? You need some feedback. And I think water's the absolute fundamental one. How many folks here um, live in a place where you're willing to get on your hands and knees and drink straight out of the creek that's in the closest to your backyard? Anybody got a creek you're willing to drink straight out of in here? You're super lucky and I would keep your identity um, quiet. Don't, do, don't put your property on GPS there. Um, 50 years ago, most of you should have had your hands up, and 100 years ago, there was no other option. So the degree to which surface water availability and quality in California is at such a state where nobody's willing to actually drink from a stream around here, I think is an indictment with respect to the lack of health of our waters as a principal measure of how we've been living on the land in our settlement pattern here for the last 200 years or so, right? And so if you believe my thesis then that you're on planet water, then the health of the waters on planet water is a principal measure of how we've been doing living on the planet. So y'all tell me what do you think, and I'm not sure you have to listen to the science folks to actually give you an indication that something's up, right? I mean, there's a little bit, you know, it's quizzically. <clears throat> right? <clears throat> I can tell you when I was in Brazil in 2008, that's a large bathing suit, and in 2014, the naked truth of the matter is it's just game on. And the deal is the planet's running a fever. It's a fossil fuel-induced fever, and there's something called the greenhouse effect. And this is, we're super happy collectively that this greenhouse effect exists on planet water. It's existed for a long time. The dominant greenhouse gas actually is water. Water vapor is the dominant gas. It's not the one in the news. Greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, right, which, where's the 350.org folks? I know there's a table back there, thank you all. Right, we're trying to figure out how to keep our, our parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere down to 350, and we just pushed 400, uh, right? And it was kind of 280 when we got this industrial revolution going. And if you basically stick a bunch of heat-retaining gases up in the atmosphere up here, Energy's coming in, some doesn't make it in, some makes it in and some gets stuck. And if you make it thicker, more heat gets retained. And that, the greenhouse effect with the thickening atmosphere results in a process that we would then refer to as global warming. And this is a sequential flow. They're not interchangeable synonyms. And as the planet warms, climates will change. And again, climate change is not a euphemism for global warming. It's a, it's a sequential relationship in a causal relation, right? And that's, it's just pretty much the deal. So what's happening is that this kind of stuff, <clears throat> I just go on the web and look at, at what's being put out there. So I love this map. This one, I just appreciate it. You get it from these, the World Energy Council folks, and there's 11, you know, 11 Saudi Arabia's worth of oil. So apparently where these red dots are, there's 673 years worth of energy in North America if you just let us scalp off half of Alberta and bring the Keystone XL down, the tar sands, right? Take all the mountaintop removal and the coal, we get 26 years worth out of that at con current consumption rates. And so a lot of times I hear in the, in the news that there's a sense of like, there's no energy crisis. We got plenty of coal. We got plenty of oil. We are going to frack California. Did you just catch the news last week? The Monterey Shale just got downgraded by the government, 96% less uh, potential recoverable petroleum reserves in there than what had been bantied about before. They just knocked the number down, 96%. There ain't no oil in there, there's nothing. It's, been a, it's, a, it's a boondoggle, right? But here's the boondoggle, is what sets the limit on carrying capacity for living systems, whether you're studying petri dishes or planets, is actually the fouling of the nest. 
It's the lack of the living organism to sequester the byproducts of the consumption of what it's addicted to that sets the limit. Alcoholics die because the liver gives out and smokers die because the lungs give out. Not because there's not plenty left in the keg or, or carton of cigarettes, right? And that's straight up how it works. Remember, I'm a biologist. I'm not, it's not judgment per se one way or another. It's just the facts of how it works. So the notion that we believe in a way and it's going to go away, and I don't know where a way is, but the sky's the limit on a way. And it truly is. Imagine the atmosphere. If you could compress the entire atmosphere of the planet into a, a density, a viscosity equal to water, the entire atmosphere, how, how deep do you think a lake that would be? It's 30 feet. The in, we've been dumping everything into the atmosphere into a lake that is 30 feet deep if it was water. Obviously, it's thicker than that. Yeah, that's not that deep. So the fact that this accumulation of heat trapping gases is causing some changes, and the fact that we have this amazing group of scientists, this intergovernmental panel on climate change that's been doing research and papers, this couple thousand scientists who are representatives of the best scientific institutions across the planet. So it's not the single of opinion of some individual who happens to be a leftist eco-freak who hates capitalism. It's not. And when we pair up these debates where there's going, it, there's going to be, well, a climate denier and a pro-climate change person, the deal is when you actually, and what they've done is a very serious review of the published peer-reviewed literature of climate change papers, and 97% of all papers published in the peer-reviewed scientific world are all clear climate change is happening, and humans are primarily implicated in the change. Right? That's just straight up how it's going. So this latest report from 2013 about human influence here that's been detected in the warming of the atmosphere and the ocean and that changes in the global water cycle with reductions in snow and ice and a global mean sea level rise and some climate extremes and that human influence is extremely likely greater than 95th percentile confidence interval scientifically, statistically, right, has been observed in the warming. What do you see that, what, what is the common denominator of every part of the primary indicators? Water. water. It's got to be water. If you live on planet water and you're running a fever, if you're running a fever, what is your body's first attempt at trying to break the fever? Anybody had malaria? Ooh, I had malaria in the Amazon of Ecuador for three days, 105 sweats and chills and sweats and chills and changing sheets. I would have been happy to die. And that happens a number of times. It's gnarly. So the, the interesting thing about a fever is if I change the liquid sweat to a gas, it's a cooling reaction. And I'm going to unpack that a little bit more. And what's up with the chills, right? Chills and fever. And I'm going to leave you with that because I'm going to keep coming back to it. But when you see this kind of stuff here, where we hear that the Arctic ice sheet and sea ice and, and Greenland and chunks falling off Antarctica and glacial recession all over the planet and decreasing snowpack, especially for us bringing it back home to California here, right? If you look at this, this trajectory that we appear to be on, this trend line of data in California, when somewhere between 60 Depends on who's counting and how they count it. 60 to 80% of California's water supply, developed water supply, comes from Sierra Snowmelt. And we're, we're, we're heading to a trajectory where in 100 years, 60, 70, 80 years, they're not going to be much. Um, and the data's pretty in for the folks who've been tracking glacier, glaciers. John Muir's data, he was an incredible glaciologist. He was up there pounding stakes in and measuring glacial movement and Crazy character. And then remember it said in the global uh, water cycle changes, it said global mean sea level rise. It didn't say global nice sea level rise because when the sea level comes up in your watershed, it ain't going to be nice. It's global mean sea level rise, right? That's a statistical anomaly, right? <laughs> so if you would like, and again, it's not my opinion, <clears throat> you can go to our own uh, Bay Conservation Development Commission, this California governmental entity that's done the most rigorous studies trying to evaluate sea level change rise and the implication of inundation. And so you can find these maps on, on the web and, and drill into them. So I went and got this one here for the Central Bay 
for you all. So, you know, San Rafael and we're down here and in the zone, right? And so where the, where the light blue is, is a 16 inch sea level rise and that's expected conservatively to occur by mid-century. And then the dark purple is end of century at 55 inches. They keep adjusting the, the rate at which this is going and it actually appears to be happening faster and faster. Greenland appears to be a bit more actively dumping water than we're uh, expecting. And things, water that sits up on top of mountains and on top of rocks and things versus sea ice. If I have a drink and I have a glass of ice, a cube of ice in my drink, when that cube of ice melts, actually the level can go down a bit because there was air stuck in there, it was floating. But if I drop a whole new cube in, i.e. dump Greenland in there, or a big old chunk of ice on Antarctica, then things go up. Thermal expansion of the ocean because of warming has raised the ocean by measure under the Golden Gate in the last 100 years already eight inches. That's just straight fact and measurements, eight inches in the last 100. And now everything else is moving from this delivery of water. So as far as I can tell, we're going to have a lot more affordable housing, right? That's housing you have to afford through to get. You have to get your house through affording, though. Is that affordable housing? No. <clears throat> so many of you this year may have learned of the idea of the polar vortex and this crazy process where Atlanta was just getting pummeled. And out here in California, we're in this crazy drought. And somehow, all of a sudden, it's snowing back east and the, the folks that are paid by an industry that pumps black stuff out of the ground, we're like, what? Snowmageddon back east. Global warming is a bunch of fooey. If it's snowing, it can't be warming. And remember I said you had sweats and chills and sweats and chills? Well, Gaia, this living planet, is as sensitive as your body, and the current temperature of the fever is 1.4 degrees. So if I'm 98.6, I had 1.4, I'm at 100, eh, I'll take an IBU and I'll go to work. Expected change on temps in the next 50 years is 4 to 6 degrees Fahrenheit, and for the Sierra Nevada, 8 to 12. So add 4, low conservative conservative, to 1.4, and I'm running a 5.5, 5.4 temp. The planet is as sensitive to temperature fever change as your body is. I guarantee it. So this game is on, and so the chills here. So what's, dri what drew, what's driving this extreme weather whiplash, as some are calling it? And this resistant recalcitrant ridge that got stuck out off the Pacific there, this high pressure ridge that stalled out here in the Pacific and pushed up the jet stream. See, the jet stream tends to run around up here. But apparently, in some recent papers published in the Geophysical Union, um, the journal there, are looking at the fact that as the Arctic warms, the differential in temperature between the tropic and the, and the Arctic, as it decreases even a little bit, it allows this atmospheric river to slow down. And anybody knows that as water slows down, it begins to meander a bit more. And so that's what this is. This is just a big old meander, a floodplain event, if you will, of energy and temperature and moisture bouncing off a big rock over here in the stream called a high pressure zone. So this river hit it, bounced off, and it's down there and it's up. And if you went around the planet, you would see there's a big wiggle because what's happening in California and what's happening in, in DC and what's happening in Bangladesh, what just happened in the Balkans? Anybody track the news two weeks ago? They got three months of rain in three days. Boom. Pakistan, two years ago, got three months of monsoon rain in three days, and within a week, 70% of the country was underwater, and the parts that didn't get rain because it fell up in the Himalaya were in catastrophic drought. This is what the climate extreme part, and, and we're seeing it all over the planet, floods and droughts and floods and droughts, right? But it's, it's, it's water that's the driver on this. So the California drought, and this paper's looking pretty, pretty good. A couple, there's a couple good papers, obviously they're still trying to work it out, is that we can start attributing this drought actually as an expression of our global warming and the climate changing climate because of this temperature differential that's been decreasing of a warming Arctic that is definitely attributable to this and the high pressure ridge and how that affects the jet stream, right? So then everybody's like, oh, well, what's gonna happen this winter? And so anybody been paying attention to the, the El Nino idea? It's been getting a lot of press. El Nino talks about when there's warm water in the Pacific and it moves from the east to the, the west to the east there in the eastern Pacific and us over here. And in years when we have extra warm water coming to us in the eastern Pacific, this El Nino effect 
if it couples with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, we often can get some really big winners. 82, 83 was one, 97, 98 was one. I moved to California in 82, 83 as a ski bum in Squaw Valley and we got 65 feet of snow that winter, 760 inches. Wow, it was amazing, great ski season, right? 97, 98, I was in Occidental, we got 110 inches of rain. Our average is 60. This year we're at 32. And guess what? Of the 32, we got 16 in three days. We got that one atmospheric river in March, and we got half of our water budget, our allowance from Guy, in three days this year. And that's how it's been acting. So I don't know. It doesn't look like everybody. This is the big question. What's this winter going to look like? And all bets are off. But at this point, I, you, I probably have you thinking just this is global weirding. I don't know what warming, change, climate, whatever. It's just weird. But actually, it's not that weird if you understand the basic physics here. Right? So I put this chart together because I'm trying to figure out how to convey this. So planet water is primarily responding to global warming by changing phase states of water. Why phase state change? Because if you take a solid and move it to a liquid, that melting process to rejigger the molecule actually absorbs energy techie term here, endothermic reaction for the chemistry geeks in the house, right? If that one don't work for you, just let it go, right? That, that absorbs energy. And when you move it from liquid to gas, as you well know when it sweats, it even absorbs more energy. So if the planet's running a fever, it's going to turn the swamp cooler on at a planetary scale, and it's going to melt every scrap of solid it can to cool down the fever, and then it's going to move liquid to vapor as fast as it can to break the fever. The interesting process is those you move that hot tropical water out as vapor. When it comes back down, vapor to liquid, guess what happens? It releases heat and it warms. So why the poles are heating up and why the high elevations are heating up is the reverse of the reaction. So it's cooling in the tropics, but it rewarms in the temperate, in the Arctic. It's a double whammy. It's a positive feedback loop is what this is called in science. And it's really important to pay attention to. So I think, does this, even resonate at all or is this way too nerdy for a, a, a Saturday night here, right? right? Is it good? So as far as I can tell, when I think about this stuff, I'm just like, my agenda here is not to depress you. Although I've been referred to as a preparanoid, for sure, the mantra I lead with as a permaculture designer is planning is best done in advance. And I would prefer to be given the authentic information and then let's decide in a proactive way how we choose to adapt and mitigate in, in ways, in pro appropriate responses. So when I look at it, I think, all right, feels like the Titanic just hit some iceberg in our worldview and our addiction to uh, behaviors in this planet that don't appear to be conducive for ongoing settlement at the, at the scale and quality that we might have been accustomed to. Um, and so I end up looking for a lifeboat. And the lifeboat I'm looking for is called a watershed. And I want to, from ridge line to river mouth and from summit to sea, I want a resilient retrofit of rehydration within this living lifeboat. And we've got to collectively, in our society, watershed by watershed, which are these naturally sculpted, created landscape entities where geology and hydrology have been having a discussion for a long time. And here on the Pacific Coast with tectonic uplift and sedimentation, it's a dynamic discussion. Right? The San Andreas Fault is right over there. And as they say, if you find a fault, don't dwell on it. But nonetheless, if you found yourself there, then what we do with forestry and farming and rangeland and suburbs and rural and urban and how do we rethink and retrofit for resiliency, for rehydration in the face of this as an adaptation mitigation process. So the Occupy movement I'm about is Occupy Your Living Lifeboat. And that means y'all got to figure out what lifeboat you live in, what watershed you live in, what basins of relations you share with your ecosystem and restore your relationship with your community of people in an area that's defined more by geology and hydrology than it is by socio-political cultural imposition. And sure, you got to go to the county board and deal with your permit and I'm not getting rid of that, but superseding that is a relationship to landscape and such. And so, as far as I can tell, the lifeboat that we happen to be in at this moment this Ross Valley area is this Corte Madera watershed, right? And then you get San Anselmo Creek running through here and, and all the different towns and we're down to San Pablo Bay. And 
Who lives where and how are y'all gonna talk to each other as a basin of relation, as a community from Ridgeline to Rivermouth to rethink and retrofit, which is a land use discussion. It's a general plan discussion, right? So it's, it's a process of who gets to put what, where, and how does it function? And that's, all right, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over, right? Location, location, location. If all politics are local, all water's even more local. And water politics, local water politics, it's the day. And so figure it out. And you have great resources in Sonoma County, I mean Marin County, for um, within your governmental agencies. In the county, watershed.org, you've got the Stormwater Pollution Prevention Program, Stop. You've got lots of really good staff here that understand and have uh, programs to support you on this. And then there's a bunch of uh, community-based watershed groups. And, uh, the water, who's the, where's the Watershed Alliance folks in the house? Show of hands, there y'all are. So go talk to them, they've got a great table over there. And, and most of the watersheds in, in, the, in, the, in your county here have some community of people who are, who are working on those systems, right? And try to figure it out. Because <clears throat> at some point, it's, it's, it's not that complicated, conceptually. Getting along with each other is really complicated. I live in an intentional community. I own 80 acres with 10 people for the last 20 years. It's a consensus-based community collective, right? So it's a glorified hippie commune. We just have shorter hair and better lawyers and accountants than they did 30 years ago. <laughs> but right, it's, we're, we're still, you know, border, it's that communist, socialist, ah, red scare thing. We just got a lot more green around there than red, as far as I can tell. And our bank account doesn't run in the red, it runs in the blue, because we have a balanced hydrologic budget. And that's what I'm interested in, we, right, is balanced water budgets. So if you don't know what watershed you live in, then you should figure it out. This is a project I did some years ago with David Berman and the Southern Sonoma Resource Conservation District, where we got funding from Coastal Conservancy, and we put watershed signs. So as you're driving around West Sonoma County, you come up over a ridge, and some ridges are more important than others with respect to the fact that they create a watershed divide. We just drove over, we came over from Mill Valley, the back way over here, and popped up over the ridge, and it was totally fun to come down into this, into this living lifeboat here and, and such. So figure that out. There's this guidebook here for developing local watershed signage, creek signage programs. If you want to download that, you can find that. Um, the Oakland Museum has this incredible series of maps, these little fold-out street maps for all nine Bay Area counties, and it'll give you the layout of the streets in Oakland and Berkeley and the actual watershed even though it may be a pipe shed all under the asphalt in culverts. And whether it's under the asphalt or not, I'm not going to argue about whose ass is at fault for it right now, but you still live in a watershed. Be clear about it, right? And then there's the game of if you believe that you don't live in a watershed and you're willing to just trash the place because you're not worried. Your water supply security will be delivered to you in a plastic bottle by a multinational corporation who privatized somebody else's spring and brought you that water and is charging you 3,000% on average more for it than what your Marin Municipal Water District's going to get it to you for. And it's not even actually regulated for quality. And it could just be municipal tap water run through a filter and now you're paying five bucks a liter and we're bitching about gas when it's at three bucks a gallon. Oh, baby. So if you believe that this is the source of your salvation, then I would suggest you're a tad bit. <clears throat> right? Because our relationship is we got to think like a watershed and we got to have some circular logic. I'm all into circular logic here. It's ecological and it's cycles and it's a revolution and it's this, this revolving planet we live on. So that's fun. So then I think, okay, I can live within the watershed. And then I'm trying to figure out, oh, what, what about these things? We were just having a little discussion about Green Gulch and, and groundwater. What happens in here? Ooh, that's magic and mystery. And hydrogeologists are like, I don't know, and divining rods and people with willow branches and water witchers. Like, who knows what happens down here, right? Some people do, to some degree. But if you're tracking the news lately, and I just went on the news to pull off this article from the Mercury News, mostly because I just wanted the graph. So this is back in March, a couple months ago. But this idea that in the San Joaquin Valley, it's sinking as farmers race to tap the aquifer. And so you can just look at all the counties and the numbers of wells that have been drilled just in the past two years, and they're going through the roof. Well drillers can't keep up in San Joaquin. Farmers are paying to buy off well drillers to come and drill on their property first. This game is on in the San Joaquin, which right before 2011, 
already had the most number of groundwater wells of any county in the, in the state. Sonoma County's second, actually. And yet, this is not a new race in the San Joaquin. <clears throat> this race is, that race has already been run there. In 1925, the elevation of the San Joaquin was up here. And over that basically 50 year period, the whole valley sank 29 feet because we sucked the groundwater out for this famous green revolution of America's fruit and nut basket that supposedly fed the world over that period. The electrification and extraction of groundwater at a rate faster than it goes in the piggy bank is a recipe for hydrologic bankruptcy. And it's called mass subsidence. And the, the, literally the valley sank 29 feet because it had been floating on a bed of water of all this alluvium, this erosional stuff that came off the Sierras and the coast range over millennia, right? So, there, there, so that, was what, that was that period of time. And I just showed you that we're, it's, it, the race is on, right? This, in 2014, these, these are all going up because this article just came out here. So it's an interesting conundrum, but Ben Franklin's got it figured out, right? When the well's dry, we know the worth of water. <clears throat> and maybe the depth of your grandparents' well wasn't so deep. And your parents a little deeper, and your kids is a little deeper. And water's the principal measure of how we're living on the land. And so a number of communities, through an assembly bill called AB 3030, are doing uh, watershed management plans right now. See, the interesting thing in California is where the last state in the union that actually doesn't regulate groundwater. Texas is ahead of us on that. The East Coast has been on this for a long time. The water under your property, the, you need a permit to dig the well and make sure the casing's good and the electrical connection's good and all that, but the actual consumption and utilization of the groundwater is free. And you can pump all the water you want and you don't have to ask nobody. And unfortunately, it's a race to the bottom. And you bring up the idea of groundwater management, which there's several bills in, in pending legislature right now. And right, <clears throat> we know how this rolls in California. And this fight is going to be very interesting because it's not going away, the groundwater fight. So pay attention to it. So while that's happening there, some of us have been working on this for what it's worth is a cross section of the Santa Rosa Plain. And I've been involved for a couple years on the development of the Santa Rosa Plain groundwater management planning process. So all of, from Windsor to Santa Rosa to Katati to Rohnert Park, Sebastopol, that whole basin there when you come over the Petaluma Katati grade is involved in a whole watershed wide, the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed groundwater management planning process. But guess what? Ground, it, ain't, it ain't groundwater until it's been surface water. And the idea that rain and groundwater, there's a beautiful US Geologic Survey uh, Service circular that says groundwater and surface water, a single resource. And California's gonna have to get that. We have to get that they're not separate. We regulate the heck out of surface water in California. Appropriative water rights and pre-1914 rights and riparian rights and, and yet you can, and some of that shallow groundwater is actually connected to the creek. And if it's connected to the creek, it actually legally isn't groundwater, but you got a well in the ground over here. So the pumping of that groundwater is drying up the streams and voila. So the first groundwater plan that I was involved with a little bit peripherally, but really it's the work of the Sonoma County Water Agency and the local people in the Sonoma Valley watershed, right? Up here north and a little bit east hedged in between Petaluma and Napa there is the Sonoma Creek. So like Sonoma Towns here, Glen Ellen's up here, wine country, all that good stuff. Um, the Carneros, Highway 37's cutting across the bottom there, San Pablo Bay. And so this was just a groundwater recharge map. And they looked at vegetation, soil, slope, and geology. And the redder it is, the worse it is with respect to the soils infiltrating water. So the greener it is, the better able that soil is to actually accept recharge and infiltration. So we're doing watershed-wide mapping based on slope and soils and geology to rethink how it is we're gonna rehydrate the living lifeboat from ridgeline to river mouth and be strategic about where we spend our limited resources if we're going to adjust how vineyards are practiced or subdivisions are practiced or urban streets are practiced. So it's getting really targeted and we have this data. It's not that complicated to get. Everybody has it. You all have it in Marin County. You have the GIS layers to do this work. That map was 8,000 bucks to produce for the Sonoma Valley. It's not that complicated. Um, 
I work a lot with folks out in the desert and the Kivera Coalition. Have a look at these, this cast of characters as ranchers and farmers. And I know John and Peggy over there, been, I've been out there with them in years past and, and such. And, and I just appreciate these basic principles. Protecting and expanding moisture storing areas and landscape while we stabilize erosion and prevent further degradation. Keep the dirt out the creek. Keep your private dirt out of our public trust waterway, right? It's not a takings of your right. Keep the dirt out of the stream. And then restore these dispersed flows and increase that infiltration at every opportunity. We've got to cultivate plant communities that build soil. What does it mean to build soil? What do plants do? What is, what is absolutely unique about the kingdom of plantae? <laughs> Check it out. They figured out a long time ago how to take little photons of energy called nouns that come down here in forms of waves. There's not, a, there's not a wave particle duality, it's nouns and verbs. And that little thing strikes a green little solar panel called a leaf and kicks off a process called photosynthesis and turns sunlight into sugar and wood? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah, I will praise that. Photosynthesis, if photosynthesis wasn't happening, we absolutely, us animals, would not be here. Give it up. The sun basically figured that out. So what does that process do when it kicks that thing off? Oh, it absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere and kicks out oxygen for us to breathe. So carbon sequestration through cultivating plant communities as a primary means of mitigating the greenhouse gas emissions, primarily CO2 in the atmosphere. We've got, to, we've got to get back to planting system. That's a fundamental way to do that. And Marin Carbon Project over here and the work that the folks at the Marin Carbon Project have been doing, go talk to John and Peggy right over here. Raise your hand, you guys. I know I'm gonna call you out. Check them out. In your county, you have one of the most radical, progressive, scientifically proven ex experiments going on all around here. It's just in your county over there in Nicasio. It's incredible. And I know they got other sites too. So that's amazing. And then you, it's gotta be site specific using natural forms and processes. So it's unique. The, the question is, it depends. So if you want to track some of this work, um, I've been working with a group called the California Roundtable on Water and Food Supply. And it's a bunch of us who get together, typically in Davis and Sacramento. The Department of Water Resource head is there. We've got Francis Spivey Weber from State Water Resource Control Board on there. We've got the leading lender for all of Bank America for agricultural lending on there. There's Trout Unlimited, there's Natural Resource Defense Council, there's OAC. There's a, it's a really interesting mix of big ag and enviros and social folks and regulators and policy wonks trying to figure out food and water supply. So in 2012, we put out this document from storage to retention. And you can find that on the web if you just noodle that out there. And we're basically saying we think it would be better perceptually in the headwaters again here that we think about storage. Instead of it being uniform, it's diverse. Instead of resisting it, we get into resiliency. We look at the landscape as a sponge with distributed storage that looks like a network where we infiltrate and reuse and we see storage as a verb, not a noun. What would that look like in your community? And then our latest report that just came out in April is this idea from crisis to connectivity, renewed thinking about managing California's water and food supply. And I'm not gonna go all the, the specifics here, but we're really interested in what does connected thinking look like that gets into institutional linkages and public stakeholder engagement. At a watershed scale in a basins of relations from ridgeline to river mouth, we're gonna have to engage in actual hydro democracy aqua democracy here, meaningful democracy in place. Another group that, that this work came out of and the, the watershed folks over there have got a, one of our earliest papers when we were the California Ag Water Stewardship Initiative and we put out this publication, Water Stewardship. Um, so if you go to agwaterstewards.org, you'll see a whole bunch of different case studies for how we can actually retrofit agriculture in a way that's resilient and improves water supply security, improves water quality, water availability, economic viability, while we're actually possibly sequestering more carbon, mitigating CO2 emissions, growing healthier food, right? Saving salmon. Imagine a grass-fed burger on a coastal prairie rangeland that infiltrates water and saves salmon simultaneously. I'll take one medium rare with a good, you know, point raised blue on top. Forget about it, right? We're in Sun Farms. I just had a great lamb burger out there in point raised the other day. We can do this. It's called regenerative hedonism. 
Right? <laughs> this design mantra does not have to be all doom and gloom. If we want to reconnect with the processes of life and re-engage with how life and evolution and physics and chemistry and biology works and get on board with that, woo, that's, that's the partnership, that's the linkage we need. As a designer, I'm pro-life. I'm probiotic. Pro-life for all species of all generations for all time. Pro-life, not antibiotic. Industrial agriculture is antibiotic by design. And tell me what the Salinas Valley looks like and what the Sacramento Valley bottoms look like when it's been sprayed and methyl bromided and tilled and put ammonia fertilizer on and groundwater's dropping and it's all GMO and it's corporately owned and it's privatized and it's water welfare because we the people are paying for them and they're selling water. It's, it's not a Congress created dust bowl out there on Highway 5. It's not. It's not. If you want to really get into this, then one of the projects that OAC does that, through Renata Brillinger is called CalCAN, California Climate and Ag Network. And these folks are working hard in Sacramento to take our AB32 Global Warming Solutions Act money that we're supposed to, our carbon trading process basically, and polluters are supposed to put money in here. Who should get that money? We think the ag sector should get a lot of that money and convert California agriculture to true organic, which means carbon farming. Organic chemistry is about carbon chemistry. So if you start farming carbon by putting it in the soil, increasing soil carbon, water holding capacity, nutrient holding capacity, healthier plants, sequestering CO2 with the money as an offset. Think about retrofitting California agriculture to organic with the money based on AB 32 across the state. The, our economy's better, ag sector's more resilient, we're pulling CO2 out, we're meeting our emissions goals. We can help Obama with the latest thing where, right, he just came out, hallelujah Obama, that he went for it with the EPA to say yes, the EPA has the regulatory authority to control and regulate CO2 as a pollutant. It's the, la the number of lawsuits that are gonna come and go before that gets solved is immense. We can just get ahead of the curve and start putting it in the ground. So if you wanna check in on how that's happening, then look at the work of CalCan. And then there's this whole thing called the water energy nexus, right? Embodied water, embedded water. So a lot of us talk about reducing our, our water, like, and how many gallons per day I might use for drinking and bathing and laundry and all that, and maybe it's 100 gallons. And so many people are playing with this number. But if you look at your water profile for how many gallons your, your electric meter requires, how many gallons does it take to produce a kilowatt hour? Because every power plant out there is attached to some water supply somewhere for cooling, for pumping, for making steam, right? So that number generally is really big. And then food is really big. So three meals a day with the lights on and taking a shower, your total budget all of a sudden looks like you're somewhere in the range of, you know, north of 1,000 gallons a day per person. So at every turn in our life, when we think like a watershed, local food, slow food, I'm into the slow food movement. How many of you got slow fooders out there, right? Slow food's an acronym, in my opinion, even though Carlo Petrini is a good friend and he's been to OEC a couple times. Slow food is seasonal, local, organic, and wild. Slow food. And we've got to get local and eat in season and support local farmers to sequester carbon and grow healthy food and local livelihood and, and economy in our own communities within our watersheds and use less water in the process. So at some point, that you can choose not to use and then less is more when you reuse. So there's lots of different ways to just use less and you may be, for those of you who are on water meters in one of your water agencies here in the, in the county are like, oh, well, voluntary 20% 20 20 voluntary reduction. Mandatory is coming for some folks more than other folks. And we just gotta figure, you gotta stop using water. <laughs> He's gotta stop. And you gotta figure out how to get through this life with less water without, and then that's gonna be, for everyone in the room, that's your own personal uh, practice. It's your own meditation. I don't know what it looks like. There is no lack of creative ways to do that. And there's, if, if you're a techno fixer, by all means, then the toilets and the low flow things and the vertical washers, the front loading washers that use 12 gallons a load versus the top loader at 40 gallons a load. And then by all means, if you're gonna wash your clothes, then um, I have another slide coming. We'll get into gray water systems. Have, has anybody participated in Marin County for the, in the Cash for Grass program? Oh, 
We're going to need some more hands up. So different, um, different cities have different programs, and I don't know exactly yours down here. I know Santa Rosa, because I'm Sonoma County, they're paying folks a buck a square foot to remove your lawn. Buck a square foot, because they need to reduce demand, because half of people's water consumption is outdoor irrigation and lawns. So now I've got a, a water hogging lawn that I'm spraying chemicals on and I'm using a device to cut it weekly that puts out six to ten times as much greenhouse emissions per hour as does a car at 30 miles per gallon. Two-stroke engines, these lawnmowers and blowers and things and noise pollution. And all you got to do is show up, get some cardboard, right? Get some little bit of compost, get some straw buy this book called lasagna gardening and there's all kind of lasagna recipes, Italian recipes, Portuguese recipes, big fat recipes and you can just kill the lawn out. Just smother it, cut the light out, herbicide with cardboard that breaks down by holding water and creating habitat for worms and it will break down and you can plant gardens right in the front yard. Just and imagine that, right? So gray water is one of those opportunities where our shower, our bathroom sink, our laundry, we can reuse that water on site so now a gallon of laundry water became a gallon of irrigation for a fruit tree and I just got two gallons for one in my water budget and I'm growing food? Really? It's called stacking functions in permaculture. And these systems, are, they build on themselves and it's a negative feedback loop. It's a self-reinforcing loop feedback loop which was different than the positive runaway train snowball effect loop that we're currently in. We have to build systems that are resilient and network together. And the one that I spend a lot of time on is stormwater management. And we have a federal EPA Clean Water Act, thank you, Nixon. And then we have a Porter Cologne Act here in California and, and such around managing stormwater. And the legacy of our stormwater land use, for the most part, especially in urban areas, has been pave it, pipe it, pollute it, plunder it. <clears throat> and we've got to switch over to solutions that are slow it, spread it, sink it, store it, seep it, share it. And it's not that hard, and guess what? It's required by law at this point. All new construction of an acre or more is required to contain, retain, on-site 80% of all rainfall that falls on the development site. That's the new, the new pattern. So it's already ensconced in law, and we got lots of opportunities. So you can either see yourself developing a degradative development design that dehydrates, and you live in the drain age, the age of draining it all away, and I don't know where away went, or you can live in the retain age, where you slow it, spread it, sink it, infiltrate it, and you see your roof as an above ground well. And we move landscapes from convex to concave, and we welcome water in, and we bring it in, and we say, here, we'll provide you a home. And we teach running water to walk. And water doesn't get to run off anymore. It has to run on and stay. It gets to stay, because it's the resource of choice. And if you'd like to get into how to do that, then this my really good friend Brad Lancaster has the two best books on the subject going. Volume one is so thick, it's your starter companion. And then if you really want to get into it, volume two is just on earthworks. It's 400 pages on how to modify the topography of your landscape to be retaining, to be retentive of water. And he went all over the planet and looked at indigenous hydroengineering from all over. It's an amazing read. We also thankfully have amazing programs in the Bay Area, especially Bay Friendly Gardening or Russian River Friendly Gardening, Sacramento River Friendly Gardening, and this idea of really thinking about gardening that connects to nurturing soil while creating wildlife habitat by landscaping locally. We conserve water, air, and quality. While we're conserving energy, we have less to the landfill simultaneously, and we get to sequester carbon and grow beautiful plants, wildlife plants or edible plants in one integrated system. It's pretty good. As far, I, I know in Sonoma County, and I think here in Marin as well, you don't work for any of the public agencies doing any landscaping on contract if you're not Bay Friendly certified. And that's an easy training. So if there's any landscapers out there, you really want to go get Bay Friendly certified. And then there's a whole wise water training as well and irrigation trainings and that kind of stuff. And then I've, I've worked with a number of counties at this point and nations and with this guide called Slow It, Spread It, Sink It. So first we pushed, put this out in Santa Cruz County with the Santa Cruz RCD, and then we, a second version came out in Sonoma County as part of that groundwater management planning program. And you can find these on the web and download them, and they're chock-a-block full of interesting ideas for homeowners and landowners for beneficial stormwater management. And then a couple years ago I got invited to go up to the Okanagan Basin in British Columbia and speak to the Okanagan Basin uh, wastewater and stormwater engineers um, alliance, if you will. And so 
they're basically, they've put this out for the Okanagan Basin, but at this point, the province of British Columbia and all urban areas, this is their guidance design manual. And I'm just make stuff up. You've already heard my language, right? Slow it, spread it, sink it. It's just a little, little meme that pops out of my head. It's amazing to see where that little meme has gone viral. It's totally fun to watch where it's gone. So check it out, it's super accessible. So what about your roof? Imagine if you just went length by width on your roof and measured it, and you happen to have a thousand square feet of roof, if an inch of rain falls on that thousand square feet, you get 550 gallons of water off that roof. It's called roof water harvesting. It's been practiced all over the world for a long time, and we're just Johnny come lately to the program around here in America. So we do a lots of these projects. This is an urban project we were doing with a bunch of uh, urban social justice, people of color, low income organizer types, a group called Movement Generation Justice and Ecology Project, which always sees a co-founder up through Dave Henson. Amazing, amazing effort in the Bay Area. And so, you know, it's, that's a think tank right there as far as I can tell. Um, and then this was a project, that, hallelujah to Spawn. Any Spawn folks in the house tonight? Paolo Boule coming in, Todd? A bunch of years ago, they worked with the Lagunita School there because there's Larson Creek that goes next to it, which is a coho spawning tributary. And they wanted to have their little garden here. So with their outdoor garden shed, they basically took that water, put it into a 30,000 gallon tank, and that's what they used to irrigate the garden. And so instead of pumping water from the shallow groundwater well, which is connected to the stream in the dry season when there's no water in there, they, live, they collect it in the winter, hold it, and then they use that stored winter water for just the dry season. So that the garden's rain fed during the winter time. So it's this idea that we don't live in a water scarce area, we live in a storage scarce area. We got plenty of income, we got plenty of expense in the budget. It's the piggy bank that needs fixing. And we have to restructure how the landscape becomes retentive, whether it's in a tank or in the ground. We've worked on a bunch of these projects, and the biggest one that's been a collaborative effort for myself the last decade plus, and then a whole bunch of groups here. There's federal agencies and state agencies and nonprofits and watershed councils and RCDs and OAC is in the town of Bodega, right, where the birds was filmed up there, one of the town, little, the small town, not Bodega Bay on the coast, but the little town Bodega. And so there's, you can download this, another AIG Innovations Network uh, case study, and basically it's our Bodega Valley Rainwater Catchment and Alternative Water Supply Program. So the fire hall has a 40,000 gallon tank off the roof, so now they can fight two fires without draining the, city, the town's water system, pretty good. That was funded by Department of Homeland Security for community fire preparedness. And then we've got 15 residential programs here, catch water off the roof and store that, again, to be used for outdoor irrigation in the dry season instead of the local well. And then this is a 240,000 gallon underground tank off of this dairy barn for Dennis Gillardi, who grows up, uh, he has a heifer replacement for dairy system there. So he catches all the water he needs off of the roof that before that was gullying out his land, eroding, dumping soil into the coho and steelhead stream. The cows were drinking out of the stream, doing number two in the stream. Their health was worse, the fish were worse, the creek was dry, and the regulators were on top of him. And with federal support, he now has 100% of the water off the roof. The cow, this is all then buried, so the cows still loaf on top of it now. And the water quality is better. The cows are healthier. He's selling organic cows now. His vet bills are down. He's making more money. The cows don't go in the creek. There's water in the creek, and the fish are happier. It's not that complicated, y'all. <laughs> <clears throat> If you want to be super cheap, this is a project I did. So if you go to oacwaterinstitute.org and you go to the DIY guides, I have all these downloadable PDFs on different subjects. And this one was about a low cost roof water system for ag. So I just took one of those flexible drain pipes, solid, not perf pipe, slice it down one side, follow the seam where it was molded, and then you just open it up, push it on top of your corrugated roofing, wrap it with wire every once in a while, or a zip tie, and then it just picks water up off the roof, in this case, goes over here, goes down into this tank, which we had. I have an onion sack on the downside of it for a filter for the oak leaves. And I just fill up water, and then I gravity feed that down to the chickens in a float switch-based chicken water. And for the last decade, I haven't provided the chickens any other supplemental water, no electricity required, 100% gravity fed in situ water on the adjacent roof of the goat milking shed. And it's beautiful potable water for the chickens. It's great. Super simple. If you wanted to drink it, 
We, I'd put some carbon filter on the other side, I'd hit some UV light on the other side, a little bit of electric demand on that one, and I could turn that water into potable grade water pretty quickly. And then we've done some other projects where we've been using uh, key line plows to, to a chisel plow to increase the receptiveness of the, of the soil and then, and, and then uh, drilling perennial native bunch grasses on contour and then digging rain gardens and long swales to pick up that surface water that's coming off our slope when it rains so hard. We got that, when we got that 16 inches in three days, because I have basically an acre and a half of surface area plus 3,000 square feet of greenhouse attached to it. So 12 inches of water on one acre is 326,000 gallons of water. So I got an acre and a half plus 3,000 square feet and I got 16 inches. So I got probably half a million gallons of water and all of it went into local groundwater right there adjacent to my well that's on fractured Franciscan melange, right? for my own well security, reduce runoff, reduced erosion, better for the fish, and I get to grow this crazy plant community of all these native plants. And I like this, the elderberries here. This here, whenever the rains, the water off our greenhouse, 3,000 square feet, so it was an inch on 1,000 square feet, was 550 gallons, right? So I'm basically getting an inch on 3,000. What's that? 5,000, you know, 1,600 gallons, right? 1,650. Every inch comes out right here, and it only fills up here. And these three elderberries were planted on the same day of the same stock and everything, and I've never irrigated them. Look how big that one got versus that one, that one. If you plant the water adjacent to these trees and give them the water, they will go get it. That's how this ecosystem in California has adapted. Native plants are used to going to get the water in a Mediterranean climate if it goes in the ground adjacent to their feet. We can reforest this landscape by earthworks and water harvesting and groundwater infiltration and then putting in plant communities adjacent to that system and then start sequestering water, but you gotta sequ sequestering carbon, but you gotta sequester the water first and then put the right veg community in, right? It's not that complicated. It really isn't, right? This is my treatise on this thing, right? This is a, called an interdigitated ditch along Coleman Valley Road. If I don't have a long linear slope to be on contour, then I just dig little mini, little bitty guys. It's like, the, it's like microvilli in your, in your intestines. It's about surface area to volume ratio for recharge. Form follows function, get creative. And then I was spending a lot of time traveling the world. I was in Africa for a couple of months. I was in Cuba for a couple of months. Working, I was just in Haiti working on this project with soil. Sustainable Integrated Organic Livelihoods on compost toilets in Port-au-Prince and Cap Haitian. Really incredible project, taking a waste problem, composting human manure thermophilically, rendering it completely free of pathogens, the cholera epidemic that's running over there, and then using that material for agriculture and for reforestation projects. And if you want to know more about that, then go to the Thermopile project, again, that John and Peggy are also involved in. Right? And we're doing similar work up in Occidental on compost toilets. But this Haitian project. But these are some uh, farmers in Zimbabwe that I happen to be working with. And this farmer was trying to figure out his swales, but he didn't understand contour. And he was digging straight across the slope versus following the lay of the land. And it kept blowing out. And I walked up, and he had just planted tomatoes. And he had these sticks and this bark that he'd stripped off of them. I was like, huh. On-site resource, relative location. I take three sticks tie them up with bark, tie the bark and with a rock on the bottom, calibrate this device called an A-frame, everybody gets an A tonight, and you can make one of the most accurate devices ever known since the Egyptians did it with the pyramids to find a dead level contour on the landscape with a two-legged plumb bob that it takes one person to run with three sticks, bark, and a rock. It ain't that complicated. You can do this. And the folks came back from this, that was two years ago, and friends just came back two months ago from this. And this woman here who was looking at me like, Mazungo, white boy, Mazungo, you're crazy. This ain't happening. This past year, they came back with footage because they got it, and they have a troop of 30 village women now that have gone to 40 villages in their watershed, and they do a dance, and it's in Shona. Shona, 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 A-frame, Shona, 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 A-frame. And they're teaching A-frames all over the region at this point because it works. It's not that complicated, right? And so if, if water's the foundation of life, it must also be the foundation of design in the built environment. It's a great saying of Betsy Damon, who's a good friend of mine. I spent two months in Tibet with her, amazing woman. We're visiting Tibetan Buddhist uh, 
headwater temples and water shrines in the high Himalaya and meeting with Rinpoches and Lamas and monks and going in limestone caves in a big cave like that is super good, right? And they're talking about climate change and loss of glaciation and snowpack and the impact in their cultural tradition in the high Himalaya. This game is on. The rest of the world's not arguing about the fact that climate change is happening. They're not. It's only a small number of people in this country here that are actually arguing about it. Follow the money, right? China's into green streets. I mean, they're super into this, right? Back in the late 70s, a community called Village Homes was built in Davis. Anybody know about Village Homes? About 250 home development out in the flats of Davis, average rainfall 15 inches, which is equal to global average, by the way. And they designed the system where all the houses, every house, the dominant side faces south for passive solar heating and cooling, so no air conditioning, no heating, i.e. water energy nexus, CO2 emissions, right? And then in between the homes are these sunken concave systems, and they have what's called a natural drainage network and 100% on-site infiltration of every drop of water from the entire settlement goes in the ground. And within three years, they had raised the groundwater 18 feet. And then they planted it with edible plants. And two years ago, my friends harvested seven tons of almonds from the street trees alone in their neighborhood, 100% irrigated by runoff from the streets. And they narrowed the streets and shaded them to mitigate the urban heat island effect. And they have all passive solar homes. Really? They did that in the 70s. The ex-mayor of Davis, I said, why hasn't another one of these been built? Because all around it, it's a bunch of nail-gunned up cracker box houses. And he said, basically, the, um, the folks tried to do it again, Judy, Michael and Judy Corbett, and the, um, the money wouldn't loan them the money. The banks wouldn't loan them, and the trust companies wouldn't loan them, and the real estate agents didn't want to get on it because it's too stable and nobody moves from village homes. And if they do, they sell it to their friends, and nobody's getting a turn on the instability of the flip and the profit margin on it. They can't make any money on it. It's too good. We've got to reform economics at some level, too. Some of y'all got to figure that out. It's not my gig. See, street edge alternatives in Seattle. Imagine this was... The, the old streets up here. It was just a straight street. This is the city's right of way. Cars went super fast. There was no parking. Kids didn't get to play in the street. The storm drains were failing. And so the city encroached on their own right of way, put a wiggly traffic calming street in, put parking, put sidewalks, and put rain gardens planted with natives along the edge of the entire street corridor. Now the street has zero runoff, no net runoff, in parking lots in America every eight months, 11.9 million gallons of oil goes to our creeks every year just from what drips out of your oil pan. And Exxon Valdez every eight months in the lower 48 from just oil pan drippage in parking lots. So all that oil now is going into here and when that oil, that hydrocarbon, comes into a beautiful carbon-rich, fungal-rich matrix, the fungus goes, bring it. I can take hydrocarbons and turn them into carbohydrates because I'm a fungus and I've evolved to snip bonds and get energy out. And then we can render that into carbon and carbon sequestration and take that pollutant and turn it into food in a beautiful, livable neighborhood that was appraising for 12 to 15% more than the neighborhood right here after the job was done. And nobody's private property got encroached on it was all within the city's right away and they did it for clean water act and endangered species act for salmonids right the money's on our side if we want to wa willing to work for water right so go up here to portland oregon they've got some issues like san francisco they have combined sewer storm water when you flush the toilet when it runs down the drain same pipe when it rains really hard sewer overflows and you get brown trout running down the street in the mission district or here in portland not pretty. And if you live in a fancy gentrified neighborhood, they don't like having fresh brown trout running down the curb. So they go up to City Hall and get pissed, right? There's a social justice component to this thing, by the way. So these folks in their wealthier neighborhood were like, this ain't happening in Southeast Portland. So the, the engineer folks basically said, all right, for 144 million bucks, we'll give you a conventional drainage system. We'll connect some pipes. We'll do this. We'll do that. We'll pay pipe, pollute it, make it go away. Convenience is killing us away, right? And the locals were like, mm, nah, we actually want parking lots with sustainable stormwater controls, and we want living roofs, we want streets that are sustainable, and blah, blah, blah. And oh, by the way, 
Y'all are going to cost us $144 million bucks in taxpayers. Our greening of the place is only going to cost you eighty-six. million. So why don't you invest the other $58 million into community resilience? by retrofitting it with green practices in situ of source controls. That's a more livable, beautiful, edible, functional, potable watershed, and I say 58 million bucks? Do the math. And then down in LA with the folks at Tree People, go to the Sun Valley Watershed Project out in San Fernando Valley, and they basically had the last community wasn't getting drainage, and if it rained an inch, the poor little Latino elementary school was under a foot of water. And the Army Corps said, okay, well, for 60 million bucks, we'll come in, we'll make it go away into this trapezoidal channel, so-called Los Angeles River. And the community was like, actually, you know what? We did a cost-benefit analysis, and we think for 100 million bucks, so 40, 40 million up front more, we want new ball fields, we want trees, we want to improve our existing ball fields. So they've done now six of these projects, and per inch of rain, they're sequestering about 3.5 billion gallons of local water that's reduced flooding inside, put it in the ground, local water supply, and they have lots and lots more trees and new ball fields that are playable longer because they don't get saturated and wet. The community's super happy, and we're saving 400 million bucks in 20 years. Do the math. Right? Aftermath is when you, right? you didn't do the math up front, and the aftermath is when it don't add up afterwards. Right? So now LA's deep into it and go to the Council for Watershed Health and treatpeople.org. They're digging up streets all over there, opening them up and putting in ways to get the stormwater in and spread it out and sink it in there. They have the geology that's sand and gravel dominated, and every community's got to understand your geology but they can do it in LA. And then small scale stormwater projects, go look at the Elmer Avenue project, rain gardens and things. And then San Francisco Public Utility Commission, this is their vision, I didn't make this, for their low impact design vision. So if you know San Francisco and you think you're looking at the peninsula going north, so the west over here, what would be the outer sunset, Golden Gate Park, it used to be lakes and dunes and then there was creeks and Bayview was a beautiful wetlands and things. And then we basically have a depleted, polluted groundwater condition and we paved it over and dump it away and combine it and filled the bay. And they're basically taking this verb and that noun and trying to combine them for their future low impact design of a groundwater recharge based creek daylighted system. SFPUC has figured out every watershed in the city. They've mapped it all out. They're working on the engineering and they're installing this, not out of the goodness of their heart, but they have to do it because of Clean Water Act issues energy issues. And guess what? Hetch Hetchy's not going to have that much water when there ain't no snowpack. And they realize it. And then you go to a beautiful site like this, the Chonggi Chung River in Seoul, Korea. Isn't that bucolic? Oh. Oh, take up that and restore the river that used to be underneath the freeway. Massive urban works happening all over the planet. What about this project in Fuzhou, China? A friend, John Todd, right? Amazing designer. Worked with these folks to take the super nasty, rancid, just disease-ridden, infested canal, puts a floating dock on it, hangs cages with gravel and plants, and pumps that pull water from here all along it, and is creating these linear uh, ornamental um, botanical gardens using biofiltration with plants and bacteria, and is cleaning up these canals where the water's clean and beautiful, and you can see through it, and no more smell in a pedestrian corridor that's now the favored place to walk back and forth through the city. If you partner with life, we can do this. And then my friend Betsy Damon did this living water garden project in Chengdu, China, Sichuan province. It's a six acre park alongside the Funan River and they pull water up out of this system, settle it here via this beautiful uh, hand pounded brass fountain that's 12 feet across. They run the water through these crazy oxygenating and livening devices called flow forms through here and then they have these livers. Living rivers need livers. Living rivers need livers. Right? Biofiltration bacteria plant based systems that run cycles of nit denitrification. And then at the far end, they have these beautiful fountains. And it's the most visited park in a city of 11 million people. And those kids are playing in unchlorinated water that came straight out of the river over there that is as rancid as you can ever imagine. It's super cool. And then I do have to just sort of leave you with my final favorite furry friend. And you got to sink your teeth into this one here for a second, people, right? Our mantra is we fight incision with incisors. 
and we're going to bring back the beaver because beaver is nature's aquatic engineer. They're the lumberman, the architect, the engineer. I got these out of National Geographic from 74. And so not all dams or dam makers are created equally, right? <laughs> and so I'm going to scoot past that story there and just say that beavers do really good things and they taught salmon how to jump. And Wyoming ranchers are trying to bring back beavers because when you got beavers, you got water. New Mexico's got a climate adaptation manual for using beavers to fight climate change. We have a beaver deficit disorder. And there's a lot of studies. When you got beaver, you got more water. And so we get these little fuzzy beavers in our 1950s look there, live trap them, and then we parachute them out of planes like Idaho did in the 40s. California did this in the 50s. No, they did them. And if you would like to review California's State of the Beaver, we actually have two new papers that some of us have been authors on that's reviewed the beavers in California. And we've rewritten the map of the historic range of beaver in the entire state. And we have a new flag since grizzlies extinct, <laughs> <clears throat> right? And so at some point, I want to pool our thoughts here to the idea of reconnecting with life and having living biofiltration-based systems that are chlorine-free, that grow food and carbohydrates like cattails or wasabi or taro, and then are stocked with freshwater prawns and crawdads and fish. And I could swim down there, bathing suit optional, grab up a prawn, grind wasabi poolside, and as the ancient Chinese saying goes, with water in the well and food in the land, what need for king or government have I? Sheet mulch the lawn, rainwater harvesting, photovoltaics, passive solar, edible aquaponics. Pretty good. So the game is, is are you part of the solution or part of the precipitate? And you're going to have to figure out, can you precipitate the change that's needed? And just because of this lovely location we're in, I do want to bring to your attention this really fascinating book that I, was happy, um, I had a pleasure of meeting the authors in Texas Tech, in Lubbock, Texas, in the Panhandle some years ago. And um, this woman here, Catherine Hayhoe, is a Nobel Peace Prize winning scientist who was with the panel, like with Al Gore, that got the prize a couple years ago for climate change, and her husband, who's a pastor, and they've wrote this, written this book, A Climate for Change, Global Warming Facts for Faith-Based Decisions. And, and I would highly recommend a read on this for all of you who are trying to track your relationship to which is their conser creation conservation or stewardship of creation. It's a, it's a really compelling read. And at some point, you're going to have to step up to the mic and speak truth to power. And if that's in a fish suit, the Board of Soups, then so be it. But conservation hydrology is really about adapting our water footprint. So I'm interested in a regenerative, rehydrative, receiving, recharging, retaining, releasing, reverential retrofit of human land use that ultimately keeps the creek clear, cold, and copious for coho, and thus ourselves, as we are mostly water. And with that, I thank you, and I'm sorry for going a little bit over here. <clears throat> I'm just jabbering. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so I know we're right at the time we're, we're scheduled in, but if it's okay with folks, I'm happy to stay and answer questions, but I, I know folks would need to leave as well. So thank you for showing up, and thank you all for hosting this here. Um, it's an amazing venue, and, and I support the work y'all do in your community. So I'm happy to answer questions, and I know there's a mic here if anybody would like. You want to answer a couple? Sure, if there's a couple. And by all means, I won't be offended. I know y'all got to go home. You probably haven't eaten dinner. Did you miss? I have a water tank question for you, Bob. Water tank. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Yeah, uh, local groundwater is it's one of the great mysteries, and so it depends everywhere depending on your local situation. So imagine you've got the ridge lines and the valleys and the creeks down here, and how surface water goes in, and, and depending on the soils, it can infiltrate in. In some cases where there's much more porous types of bedrock or a gravel, alluvium it's called, that can go underneath smaller ridges, and there may be larger basins true aquifers, like the Ogallala Aquifer that spans five states in the Midwest from Texas all the way up almost to North Dakota. 
And then in small watersheds, you may have perched aquifers and little basins hanging just below creek beds or up on slopes in special spots, springs coming out. So it's a, it's a big, it depends, but as far as how you might know in your community, uh, you would ask the local planning agency folks and your water agency, your local well drillers know. If you're not on a municipal system and you're in a rural unincorporated area that's required to go get its own water by a well or spring development, the well drillers are the smartest people out there because they're the ones punching holes there and they know, oh, that ridge ain't got no water. Oh, that's water. 200 feet or 20 feet or this feet. And, and then they're the ones being hired to redrill wells deeper or to put new pumps in or to lower pumps. And they have a, they're, they're making a living th the further it goes down. So they have a pretty good sense about the state of things in your watershed. So your local well drillers are the, they're the ones with dirt under their nails that know better than anybody. You know my answer, <clears throat> it depends, right? So <laughs> the beauty of it depends means is, it, obviously we would like a potable or food grade based type of tank with respect to the water if we're planning to drink out of it or provide to our livestock. So there are plastics that are food grade or fiberglass that are food grade, stainless steel, galvanized tanks, depending, redwood if you're lucky enough to get them, um, depends. There's food grade poly liners that go inside other structures, barrow cement, wire cages that are plastered with cement that are made to hold water and provide potable grade water. So it kind of depends on your budget, the availability, your materials, and, and, and what works for your site and the volume of water you need. Different tanks are cheaper at different, there's economies of scale with different technologies and such. But water quantity is a concern. There's two cues with water, quantity and quality. And so the quality concern not just the quantity, is really important. What's the roof material? What was the piping material? What's the first flush diverter off the roof? What's the tank made of? What's the plumbing made of? What do I filter it? You have to ask that question of all materials through the whole entire materials chain. And you do your darndest. I don't know. It's a good question. Hi, Laura. Hi, Laura. Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm hoping, and every time I get a chance, I talk to our congressman, Jerry Kaufman, and I'm on this, the ladies of the group, talk about this. And I just wonder if you were just in Haiti and places, and I'm hoping that, you know, you can help people craft some policies and solutions because I think you're really ahead of the curve. Thank you. Well, so our option really is to get clear of that we should stop defecating the water cycle and start defecating the carbon cycle. I would first choose to go the anaerobic, the aerobic cycle with oxygen, thermophilic composting, again what the Thermopile project is doing, what we've been doing. We have the oldest legal compost toilet in probably California, a 45 year old permitted toilet when it used to be the Farallons Institute is where OEC is. So with oxygen, with heat, biologically based composting systems like I described in Haiti is absolutely doable, it's scalable, and we can do it in a way that protects public health and safety, reduces energy use, and absolutely saves water, and then generates a material that we can actually grow plants with that helps sequester more water, right, via the plant process and, and carbon. What you described first is a biogas system, and that's where you use manures, humans or animals or otherwise, or green material, a lot of nitrogen rich material, and you anaerobically without oxygen make a slurry out of it and it bubbles off methane gas, carbon with four hydrogens on it. 
30 times as strong as a greenhouse gas, so don't let it get away. And then you can combust that, and then every combustion process yields CO2 and H2O. So at least, then you're venting off your, your CO2, but a lot less, but you're getting all those m multiple benefits out of that. And then the slurry out of those systems is incredible fertilizer and can be used. Uh, uh, Strauss, uh, you know, over in Marshall, Strauss Dairy's got an amazing methane digester, and they're running all the electricity for that whole operation over there in Marshall is off a methane digester from the manure lagoon that they then burn that methane and use the energy to turn a turbine to the grid inner tie to make electricity, and then they still get the waste material out that's more nutritious and better for land application for growing crops in than, than just raw sewage like most of the manure lagoons are being done. So it's a diversified portfolio of investments with respect to how we're going to manage this, and, and there's different approaches that are unique for each watershed and basin, and, and depending on your community and your soils and your need. But we have all the tools and toys to do this. We don't need to invent new stuff. We know how to compost human manure aerobically or anaerobically in a better way than making it go away. Yes, sir. Our governor seems quite hot on his uh, twin tunnels proposal, the uh, <coughs> version of the old vertical canal, which got created totally easy to do it without going to a vote. What do you think of that project? Do you think it will happen? And if you don't like it, do you have an alternative proposal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that was just kind of an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. You cannot do a talk without getting into the Delta. No, thank you. I, um, I try to stay out of Delta politics as much as possible. The punnel, it's called, right? A peripheral tunnel. It's got tunnels and a peripheral canal. It's called the punnel. And I, I can get on board with that as, a, as someone who's a, a punning linguist here, um, you know, with aquaponics. Um, I, I'm, I, the game is, is how big, how much water's going to who and who's got the keys to the, to the castle on that. And, and it, the state of the delta and the state of play and SoCal and NorCal and the water and the fish and delta smelt and sea level rise and, oof, and, and they've had delta councils and delta things and delta this is and that, you know, delta, you know, change, right? That sign. Well, I don't, that's just an ever changing game. So I'm going to, I'm going to punt on that one because <clears throat> I don't know. My pea brain's not big enough to take that one on. There's one up here, I guess. <clears throat> I'd just like to know if you have done a TED talk. Mm -hmm. If not, we have. Yeah, I did a TEDx in Mission, so if you put my name in and go Brock Dahlman TEDx, it's a 22 minute version of this that was sort of city focused. So you won't have to suffer through my lengthy hour plus thing here. You can just get the fix in 22 minutes. All right. Thank you again for being accessible to us tonight. Yeah. Thank you all for showing up. <clears throat>